so early one morning as I was waking up, this really strange word came into my mind. You know that state that you're in, you're not quite asleep and you're not quite awake? Well, I thought, Agapanthus. Agapanthus. I had never heard of that word. What is it? How strange. So what I did is I wrote it down. I keep a little notepad next to my bed uh, for such times as the, these. A lot of um, the ideas that I get, a lot of the inspiration, I get in the middle of the night. Paul Rogers stood up many nights. Um, uh, and so once I write these things down, I'm able to get back to sleep. So I found this. When I Googled it, I found it something very interesting. An agapanthus is described as a lily of the Nile. But it is neither a lily, nor does it come from the uh, Nile River region. More interestingly, further, I found that agapanthus is made up of two Greek words. Does anyone here remember their Greek from school? Other than Chrysanthi, who's my Greek girlfriend. <laughs> if you don't, okay. Sorry, could I? Pantheon servants. Right. Great. Agapanthus, agriculture, a farmer. Thank you. Agape. Mm -hmm. Agape meaning brotherly love, not not the other kind of love, not eros, which is another kind of love, not philos, which is another kind of love, but agape, brotherly love. And the other part of the word, agape, and anthus, anthus meaning flower. And I thought, wow, how perfectly fitting that this title be given to me to describe this book because what the book is about is basically people and life experiences. And um, they're short stories, so the chapters read very fast. But what I do at the end is I turn the tables around and I ask you to put yourself in the situations that I've been in, whether I was leading a mission, uh, leading a mission trip or a work situation. So um, that's how the word Agapanthus came to me. And um, again, I find it symbolic that it, um, the flower is so represented to humanity. So, what I'd like to do, if I may, um, I'd like to read a couple of short excerpts from the book. Uh, these are taken from two volunteer service trips that I led, one uh, in Rwanda and the other one in Costa Rica. <coughs> Excuse me. We will start with the one in Rwanda. The most impactful experience of my life happened in July of 2006 when I went to Rwanda as part of a church volunteer group. The purpose of the visit was to monitor programs sponsored by the congregation involving child-headed households and single women suffering from HIV AIDS. For months, I prepared by attending protocol workshops, learning basic Kenya Rwandan, reading about the local history, and absorbing important cultural facts. Most of the country's population is under the age of 30, the result of the 1994 genocide that over the course of approximately 100 days killed nearly 1 million people, almost 20% of the country's total population. It was the culmination of long-standing tensions between two tribes, a mass slaughter of Tutsi and moderate Hutu by members of the Hutu majority. <clears throat> Other than a small United Nations peacekeeping force on the ground headed by Canadian Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire, the call for help by Rwandans has been largely ignored by the rest of the world. One day of this trip is particularly etched in my mind. We visited a family living at the summit of one of the thousands of hills. This country has so many hills that I was impressed that the driver knew which one we were looking for. We stopped when the van could no longer continue. The mountain was very steep, as they all are. They're really, it's quite a beautiful country. From this point, wearing rock sacks on our backs, we hiked nearly half an hour to reach the family. We were greeted by a young woman, barely 20 years old. She was the head of this household and was raising four of her younger siblings. I have 
this is actually not the actual family that I was talking about, but the country is riddled with young children racing for siblings. <clears throat> Excuse me. She was the head of this household and was raising uh, four of her younger siblings. The small home where they were living was made of mud with a dirt floor. The interior was bare except for a calendar nailed on the wall showing a picture of Jesus. Except for what they were wearing, they owned no other clothes. Even these were so patched and frayed as to be barely serviceable. The great fragments were in tatters and there were no shoes in sight. Through a translator, we learned that they daily foraged for food and water. Since the river is at the base of the hill, I could not fathom making this trek every day. And knowing how little grows in the soil, which is very acidic, by the way, I wondered about their diet. Although they seemed healthy, they were all stick thin. Their heads protruded from the meager shoulders, and we could see their ribs. They had lost all their older relatives in the slaughter. The five of them had been surviving the elements under a tree for many months until someone opened this home to them. About one hour into the conversation, the oldest girl left. Uh, left. I know that I speak for everyone who was in the room that day when I say that what happened next is one of those humbling moments that changes our lives forever. Minutes later, the girl reappeared with a dinner-sized plate of boiled manioc, a tuber-like vegetable with the consistency of a potato or a yucca. From everything that we had learned, it was evident that this dish represented several days of nourishment for the family. They were giving us the only food they had. To make the pain of my heart ripping apart even stronger, the young girl placed the dish on the ground and asked whether she could say a blessing before we ate. I was never so glad to be in the back of a group. Being next to the door, I slipped outside and began to cry. This excerpt is taken from a trip that I led to Costa Rica. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had been to Costa Rica on numerous occasions, accompanied by different volunteers each time. The opportunities for service in this country abound, and I encourage making time for service if you ever go there on vacation. One time, I met Mr. Smythe at a state-run nursing home, an elderly man of African descent. He wore a French beret, that's why Mr. Smythe, a spotless white shirt and magenta pants. A passerby brought him to the home after he had been abandoned next to a riverbank and left for dead by his family. He was a happy and gentle fellow. He talked about his ancestry and King Kingsfolk, who had come from Jamaica to build the railroads of Costa Rica. Most of them settled in Siqueiros, the only black community in the country and the only region that serves tea instead of Costa Rican coffee. British English is spoken. Methodist and Angli Anglican hymns are sung at church services. I had a lengthy conversation and, uh, with Mr. Smythe, and we laughed a lot, we kidded, we joked. He sang me songs while playing his guitar. And after some time, when he realized that I had absolutely no clue, he began to chuckle. From his demeanor and engagement and engaging conversation, I could have not known that the man was completely born. Mm -hmm. Where does the power come from to be so joyful after being discarded by your loved ones and losing your eyesight? I keep a framed picture of Mr. Smite holding his guitar, another beautiful reminder of the power of forgiveness, and that to forgive requires making a choice. Roxana so that she can address 
things you're thinking about. Um, nobody asked her, why did you write this book? <laughs> or she told you a little bit about the background, how long she's been keeping notes, how long it took her to put together. You got to hear about the plant, the flower, Agapanthus. And by the way, you can buy them anywhere here in the spring, plants. They, you put them in the ground, they are perennials because they're bulbs, they'll come back forever and ever. They don't need much care, they survive drought, they survive everything. <laughs> buy yourself, oh no, they were gone by the spring. By the spring. Um, but, so you got that much. So, find out why she wrote this book. That's a question that many of you have been asking me, why did I write the book? First, let me just say how difficult it was to write the book. Um, it's not easy to bear yourself open and lay your life open in a book to help others. Um, I wrote this book because I want people to remember who they are, to reawaken to a very, very real and universal truth that we, each of us, are the creators of our own destiny. Now what happens when we live with that universal truth? Something very real happens. In fact, it's been documented scientifically <coughs> that when you begin to live with empowerment, the knowledge that you have control of things, and you know, to learn how to do that, of course, it takes time. And, you know, I do provide some tools in the book. But when you begin to live your life with that knowledge, something wonderful happens, something, quote, miraculous. Things that we knew without, that we didn't know a thousand years ago were called miracles. Well, today we have the knowledge, we have the tools to know that a lot of the miracles that happen today are because you make them happen. This evening here, because people make things happen. Going on volunteer trips and, and having those experiences, it's the people that participate. So, um, I want to leave you with that thought that each of you is empowered with the keys to create your own destiny. And when you live, really own that knowledge, then you begin to live your life. Oh, something happens, by the way, let me backtrack. Something happens. There's a shifting of consciousness that happens. And scientists have learned that the brain actually, the, the, the neurotransmitters in the brain actually start firing different parts of the brain that were dead before. And what happens, physically it affects your body and you begin to feel lighter, happier, full of joy. And so you begin, when that shift of your consciousness uh, happens, you not only begin to live life differently, you see things differently. And that is when you start to live with passion peace, and purpose. Thank you. So we got a sense of not only the spirituality, but the spirit of the book, and um, the mantra of making decisions, making a choice, um, whether she talked about this gentleman? Mr. Smythe. Mr. Smythe. Not Smith. Not Smith. British Smythe. Smythe. <laughs> uh, decision to get up and be happy every morning in spite of what had happened to him. So you have that little experience in touch for you, uh, in, in place for you as you get going in this book. And also, I, I wanted her to talk to us about her experience with quantum physics. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a subject. I, I coined the term nerd. Uh, someone asked me, what do I do in my free time? I have volumes of quantum physics books that I love to read. I sit in the corner and I'm never happier than reading quantum physics and spiritual, spiritual books. Um, unfortunately, it is a subject that... Sorry? Now we can relate to you. I know. <laughs> I told you I'm a conceptual nerd. Um, so it's a subject that I can talk about all night, and certainly we don't have the time for that tonight. But again, it does go back to the idea that science and religion are really two sides of the same coin. I don't know at what point or when in history we decided to separate both of them. 
what people used to think were miracles a, a thousand years ago, we know as back today, and a thousand years from now, maybe walking through a wall may no longer be a miracle. So, uh, but if you're really interested in that subject, I'm more than happy to talk to a group, to you individually, whatever. I do a lot of public speaking. So. <laughs> Well, you're in good company with Einstein, because when Albert Einstein was asked, do you believe in God, he said, do I believe I know? So, um, how about other questions? Anybody? Mr. Otto? Rock? So I kind of, it resonated with me that, that you keep a little piece of paper next to your bed, and you can't sleep unless you jot those things down. I have kind of that same... Sickness or whatever. Um, and I wonder if a lot of other people have that, and if writing this book was somewhat cathartic for you, just to get it out there, get it on the paper. Um, well, as I said, you know, it took me 57 years to write this book. <laughs> people, you know, keep asking, when do you have time to write this book? Well, it's not something that I just did. Um, it really was a, um, you know, a build up to it. And it was two years ago that I started the bulk of the manuscript, but it wasn't until the summer that I finished it. But interestingly enough, it, it was in April of this year where I had a renewed sense of energy. Something happened within me. It was as though somebody had watered that sleeping ball. And it just it just came out of me, and I, I was able to finish it. So. Yes, Lynn. Tell us about your foundation. In 2003, I was um, asked, uh, there was a spot open uh, for a volunteer trip uh, through a church. They sent out an email um, statewide, and I was the one to answer. <laughs> I had never been on a volunteer trip abroad before. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had done plenty of volunteering um, locally, um, domestically. So I answered, I went to Bolivia, and uh, it was an amazing experience. And at that point I was already, something was tugging at my heart about sharing with others the joy and the fulfillment and, and just the pleasure of serving people. And so I did a lot of thinking about, you know, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? When I was in Bolivia, and by the time I came back I realized that I had to uh, found a, an organization that was open and available to people from all walks of life. Um, not just uh, religious organizations, I had certainly been very involved with churches, I think, uh, Susie and your, uh, when, you, when you read that um, about my, my past, and I was actually a lay minister in the Methodist Church, so, um, but I didn't want any affiliation with a religious organization. I, I didn't want dogma tied to it, because this is so much bigger, so much bigger, and um, I wanted it to be available uh, and accessible to people from all walks of life. In fact, we've had a lot of atheists come on volunteer service trips, and um, just to be able to share time and learn from each other during those moments. You know, at the end of an evening of a hard day's work when you're out there shoveling, literally mixing cement with a shovel, you know, sand, uh, cement, water, and you're there all day long, at the end of the day, you sit down, you have a meal together, and you just get to know each other. And I tell you, no amount of, you know, no closings, no multi-million dollar Conyers property that I closed. <laughs> I thank you, I'm not, no, please, keep them coming, coming. <laughs> but um, it has given me that, that joy, really, truly joy. Yes. Knowing your husband for years, I'm wondering if you accredit any of your renewed energy and vitality to clams, oysters, and shrimp. <laughs> no, it's going to hate me for this because I don't touch the stuff. No, I have really, in the last couple of years, uh, I would say I'm 95% vegetarian. and. Um, I attribute a lot of the energy that I have, and oh gosh, where's my yoga teacher and my yoga group? Raise your hand, where are you? Ashtanga <laughs> people! <laughs> oh my gosh! Um, I attribute a lot of my energy to certainly the yoga that I have been taught. Um, as a child in Peru, I never had the opportunity to do any physical education. 
Um, you read about it in the book as to why. So um, I was limber. I didn't have, you know, I, it was when I came to this country at the age of about 12, second time around, that I, I ever hit a handball. <laughs> um, I was really uncoordinated. And so, um, you know, Ashtanga has really helped me. Ashtanga is a form of yoga and meditation and all kinds of things that you read about in the book. So, um, Try not to eat too much meat. Fully. I'm not passing judgment. For me, I just have so much more energy, and uh, I can go for days without eating. You know, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, some people came in late. They haven't even managed to get to the bar. So they don't have to get to the bar to find a seat. Do we have any other questions? Well, Roxana, one more thing to share with you. Roxana just briefly uh, touched on her childhood and growing up. So can you tell us a little bit about life in Peru, what you did there, how your mom brought you and your sister growing up in Beverly Hills, and then finally Roger got her here. <laughs> My mother, a uh, single parent, uh, brought my sister and I to uh, Beverly Hills, actually. And um, she came here to this country. When she first came, she came alone. She left us behind to uh, be careful by her uh, parents. And uh, when she brought us back, basically she came here with $100, two suitcases, two girls who spoke absolutely no English. And she didn't speak much English when she first came either. And, um, you know, we, we saw the American dream. We, we saw what a good education could provide. Living in Beverly Hills, of course, like living in Greenwich, we were surrounded by a lot of very successful people, and I knew I wanted that. I knew more than anything that I, I wanted to be successful, and I knew what it took to get there. So um, this book, believe it or not, is a tribute to my mother. Um, Please read the introduction. It, it, it sounds a little bit harsh, what I have to say about her, but it's not meant to be. Quite the opposite. Um, I, I thank her for the kind of sacrifice that she made. She left family, friends, to give us a future. Um, and um, I, I can't imagine doing that at the age of uh, 40 years old with two children, coming to a strange country. And uh, so this is a tribute to my mother. Uh, what inspired you? People like you, David. <laughs> I mean, um, my inspiration comes from all of you. When I when I say I'm so glad to see you here tonight, I mean that. Um, every time I have come across some someone or have had an experience or have learned a lesson, I I, I keep those little notes because. One day there may be a second book, Susie. <laughs> We're ready. Um, you know, it is friends like you who inspire others. And that's what we're all here to do, to inspire each other. It's not a, um, you know, coming from a business background, I was a commodities trader with Solomon, the Fibro Solomon. People forget to be human. People forget that you don't have to lose your humanity and your divinity to be a great and successful business person. So let's all remember that. I think during this upcoming holiday season, if I can just, I want to wrap it up. I promised it wouldn't be too long. I just want to say, um, I hope that this upcoming Thanksgiving season is filled with opportunities for you to help you make the kind of choices that will help you, like the Agapanthus, rise to the light. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.